welcome everyone to our discussion on the importance of the history of economic thought and research and teaching in economics. And uh, this is actually a premiere. This is uh, the first in a loose series of uh, public news white beam events uh, sponsored by the Network for Constitutional Economics and Social Philosophy. Uh, and uh, it's nice that we start off with uh, such a wide international audience. Uh, thank you all for being here this evening. And uh, on this topic of the importance of the history of economic thought, we have two discussants today. Um, on the one side, we have Stefan Kolev uh, from the University of, Pl of Applied Sciences at Zwickau in Germany, who is a professor of economic policy there and also a very prominent researcher on the history of economic thought. Uh, he has published in leading journals in the field, and he's also uh, an editor of two journals of the Ordo yearbook, a uh, very um, long uh, a journal with a long tradition in Germany and a, and a very good standing, I hope, in Germany, and also the Journal of Contextual Economics, formerly the Schmollers Jahrbuch. And on the other side, we have uh, Rudi Bachmann, who is a professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame, with a focus on macroeconomics. Um, he does both uh, theoretical and empirical work. He has published, for example, in the American Economic Review, the European Economic Review, and uh, very regularly in the Journal of Monetary Economics, uh, one of the top fields in macroeconomics. Um, and apart from being a highly recognized macroeconomist, uh, Rudi is also very much engaged in methodological debates, um, very well known in Germany for being engaged in method methodological debates. Um, so I think we have a, we, we can expect a very lively discussion between the both uh, this evening. We will have uh, brief opening statements from the two discussants, and then we'll have a conversation between both of them for about 45 minutes to one hour, depending on how it goes. And after this, the floor will be open for questions and remarks from the audience. And uh, you can already enter your questions or remarks into the chat, and we will try to include as many of, of them as possible uh, as they come in. So. Uh, I think uh, let's start with the opening statements. So let's start with uh, Stefan, I think. About five minutes for the opening statement. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Jan, and thank you to the News Network, but above all to all of you for uh, the time <clears throat> to discuss a field which, as Jan said, is very close to my heart, and I hope um, tonight we'll have a fruitful discussion. I would like to start with a disclaimer. So what I will not do is I will not bash today's economics. I will not call it mainstream or neoclassical, but above all, I will not bash it. Uh, what I hope to contribute by that introductory statements, but also by all the other comments, is really <clears throat> to show how history economic thought can add and contribute to the beauty of today's economics. So how can we make today's economics even better and even more colorful, both in teaching and in research? My main proposition is that we have to look very closely and carefully at the notion of scientific progress in economics. And so <clears throat> while I do not deny that, of course, there is progress, I doubt that it is linear. Instead, I buy into the diagnosis of Josef Schumpeter, who says that progress in economics proceeds in a crisscross manner, which probably in his German or Austrian mind means zigzag. And so what I would like to say is that we often forget. Now, sometimes we forget for good reasons, right? So if theory or a method is really flawed, if it has logical uh, deficiencies, we should forget it. But very often we forget for other reasons. We forget out of fads and fashion. So certain theories become fashionable and uh, well, collect lots of followers. Sometimes we forget for reasons of power. So sociology of science is important. And sometimes we forget because a theory at a certain point of time and space loses its, its topicality and is forgotten because it doesn't help to shed light on a certain moment of modernity. But that topicality can return. And so forgetting for those last reasons um, can be a problem. What I'm struggling with, and I hope that tonight we will find some um, at least partial answers to that, is that we do not have a clear cut criterion to distinguish um, 
or let's say to, to show whether new knowledge per se, understood as the knowledge in the last issues of the best journals, is really all we should know, and whether everything which has been forgotten and is not published in those journals is uh, cut out uh, correctly so. So the Popperian mindset, which most of us implicitly have and have been taught since, uh, since undergrads, in my view of economics, um, doesn't really or can have deficiencies. And if it does, so if we have scientific progress in that crisscross, not systematic, nonlinear pattern, then I believe that history economic thought can be a very rich treasure trove, or if you prefer somewhat less pathetically, a set of tools which can be harnessed um, with relatively little effort uh, as low hanging fruit. So as I would hope to show, and as I hope the discussion will show quite economically so. I have five points which I would briefly like to make on why uh, history economic thought is important for students and then for researchers. To start with the students. So in Germany, at least, uh, the field of economics uh, has been in relative decline over the past 20 years. So I started studying 20 years ago in Hamburg and I checked the numbers and uh, the field is basically staying, roughly speaking, the same size, whereas um, fields like business or law have been exploding. And so how can we perhaps help by some small add-on of history economics? Um, um, how can we help? Well, to begin with, I hope that students who start out studying economics with social problems on their minds might recognize by encountering such a course in their first semesters that economics is about social problems, which in today's teaching is not very obvious when we start with teaching economics. Second, I hope that students will take pride in that field, in, that, in their choice of having picked economics, mm -hmm. so that they should basically get proud of the intellectual plenty, which uh, modern economics, but also economics before Adam Smith uh, have, and also the formative power of economics on the modern world. Uh, and that pride should help us keep those students uh, who quite often jump off and um, switch to other fields. Third, um, I hope that students will learn to read and write, which uh, is not really um, what we quite often teach them. And so history economics can uh, help a little bit uh, in both those dimensions. And we have Deidre McCloskey among us, so um, uh, that is uh, not unimportant to underscore. Fourth, I hope that students will be able to recognize economists as humans. Now, if you know Rudy from Twitter, Rudy from Twitter is probably quite different from Rudy in his papers. Um, but since um, it's helpful to know him also as a person, um, and it, it's helpful also to study history of economics as a history of humans and also institutions, but especially humans who produced economic thought, um, because otherwise um, meeting those people only through their theorems or axioms um, is not really what these people were about. Fifth and last, I hope that history of economics can help students with critical thinking, not meaning that other fields in economics, other courses, do not underscore critical thinking, but I do believe that um, if you learn a plurality of methods and theories, um, you can progress. And with a smiley, I would like to add that it's also helpful for remembering all those methods and theories. So mnemotechnically, it's helpful to have heard a little, about, about, a little bit about the people who have generated those theories and methods. Why is it helpful for researchers? And with that, I would like to conclude those introductory remarks. So given today's specialization of economics, which is wonderful uh, and inevitable, um, and given the crisis of our time, there is demand for economics, but the question is, uh, do research, can researchers profit from having more knowledge of the history of economics to meet that specific demand today? My first point is that economists can get concrete ins inspirations from history economics. I have a, an acquaintance who is at MIT, made a great career, and he specifically says that he, doing labor economics, that he profits quite a bit from history of recent economics, which focuses on his field. That is one example out of many. And of course, the history of recent economics is the most obvious candidate, but not the only one. Given that specialization, which we have today, and which um, Hayek, who, by the way, passed away today, if it cares for you, some of you. Uh, so if we have that specialization, we need, as I 
I think, some shared identity of, of economists. And um, historians of economics and the teaching of history economics could be um, one part of contributing to that shared identity, because otherwise we would have those specialists who have difficulties to not only talk to each other, but really perceive themselves as a, as a community with, a, with an identity. Third, it helps also researchers to debunk certain myths which they have just picked up in textbooks, like Say's Law, or with the notion that Adam Smith only understood uh, absolute advantage and not comparative advantage. Re current research has a lot to say about those interesting things. And I think researchers may really get uh, some more sophisticated notion of the concepts they are using uh, than the traditional and sometimes flawed knowledge out of textbooks. Fourth, that we, by studying history economics as researchers, we also get more attentive to issues of value judgment and normativity, and by that become more critical of our role as experts, which not only in the corona crisis um, is extremely topical, but which mm, quite a few of us, I think, just practice without having reflected too much about it. And fifth, um, I would like to say that, again, Deidre McCloskey is among us, by studying those old texts, I think we can appreciate the role of rhetoric and see when and with what rhetoric economists at certain points of times and space were particularly successful in helping society solve its problems and what rhetoric uh, was perhaps less helpful. My concluding sentence of those, of those introductory remarks is this. Um, Crawford Goodwin, who was um, the doyen of history economics and a long-standing professor at Duke, passed away four years ago, has identified a golden age of history economics in the 20th century with names like Hayek, Hicks, Keynes, Robbins, Rafa, Stigler, Viner, or more recently, Arrow and Samuelson. Now, Rudy and I are not, that, are not those graced minds Right, so none of us is Hayek or Arrow or Samuelson, that for sure. And certainly economics as practiced today is much more specialized than it used to be. But I, what I hope for is really um, a division of labor, a division of labor between theorists and historians. And I hope that discussions like tonight's will be more fruitful and show that those division of labors can be made fruitful if they were not perhaps in the recent past. Thank you. Okay, thanks Stefan for this opening statement. Um, and I think we should continue with Rudi right away um, and giving his opening statement. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, at least I assume the most of you are it's evening where I'm it's just early afternoon. Um, thanks to the news network for inviting me. It's a, it's a great honor and a great pleasure to be here. Um, and there's lots to agree on actually what what Stefan said and perhaps we can we can uh, do so later in the in the discussion um, obviously since I didn't know uh, Stefan's opening statement I don't have a direct reply to him so I'll have to do that a bit later um, so I'll just start with, with with my prepared remarks so personally I'm actually a great fan of uh, you know the history of thought this basically started uh, just to give you a little biographical uh, a tidbit here is uh, uh, started with my master of, uh, 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 thesis in philosophy in Mainz, where I, it was a it was a sort of a, a, a scientific a philosophy of science econ the, uh, uh, master thesis, and there I read a lot of uh, sort of uh, economists long forgotten, like people like I don't know, I mean most of you probably have heard of them in this crowd, but in a normal econ crowd, people wouldn't even know like Friedrich von Gottel or Lilienfeld for example. Anyway, so, so, and I've always, you know, I've always found uh, reading uh, sort of textbooks uh, about history of thought uh, uh, interesting. And I've sort of always loved this as, as sort of, you know, bedtime reading, I guess. Um, and I'd love to have the time to, you know, to sit an entire lecture by Stefan or Arash, who I, who I deeply admire uh, mo uh, mostly through our interactions um, of, uh, on Twitter, okay? So I do think, of course, that a scientific discipline has a, a certain conscience of its um, historical uh, development, a sense of its place in, in sort of in history, and, and, and that it, you know, that there was a development uh, uh, to where we are. 
I think that's good. And for, uh, as Stefan mentioned already, for no other reason that we don't want to kind of repeat past mistakes, right? Um, so we have to be aware of them. So, okay. So, and now there's a big but, because I guess the choreography of this whole uh, evening requires that, uh, 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 you know, I'm, I guess, I don't know, the anti, <laughs> the anti guy uh, or the contrarian. Um, although I'm reluctant, as I said, as my initial remarks uh, should, should highlight, I'm a little bit reluctantly so. Um, but uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the rhetorical device, uh, we, we need to ask questions at least. Um, so how does this look concretely when we say we would like to have more um, history of thought, say, in, in our undergraduate curricula? Let's start with that, right? Um, you know, take Germany, we have a very regulated uh, uh, bachelor. I mean, in the United States is a bit situation a bit different, but in Germany, it's a very um, regu regulated uh, uh, major, you know, um, there's very little room for, there's very little room for sort of free study, if you wish. And so, you know, by the time you are through with the basics and the, you know, the core, what people consider the core, and then you would like, uh, you know, some specialization in some fields. Uh, and then on top of that, you might want to have, uh, you know, all the other things like economic history that especially recently, a lot of people think has become more important. And I agree with that, you know, the, especially in macroeconomics, we have, I think we have re reached a, a bigger appreciation of sort of the long, the long development. Moritz Schulerich, for example, in Germany has contributed uh, uh, to that a lot. And then maybe on top of that, we'd like to have our students sit in, you know, a sociology class, a political science class, a philosophy of science class, or something like that. So you kind of see where I'm going. Uh, the, the, the curriculum gets, gets more crowded and, and ever more crowded. And at some point, you just have to choose, right? And, and so, uh, and so if, if, if you demand or if someone demands that history of thought should be more uh, a bigger part in our say undergraduate curriculum, we might have to think about what we're going to throw out, okay? Um, similarly with the PhD, with the PhD curricula, uh, again, um, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still always struggling uh, with what uh, to put in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in our PhD curricula. Um, typically in the United States, it's a two-year program, a two-year course program. That's somewhat different. It's not always the case in Germany, at least, but in the United States, it's a two-year curriculum. That's, again, very, very crowded. And it's not clear what you would want to take out, right? Do you want to take out core macro? Do you want to take out econometric techniques? Um, and, and especially the, these new techniques that keep piling up, Currently, we are seeing a big data revolution, a, um, you know, uh, a machine learning techniques, sort of a whole lot of, a whole new toolbox added on to, to economics, then also textual analysis, web scraping. So we can do things now uh, um, that we, we won't even be able to do really, uh, certainly when, uh, almost when I did my PhD 15 years ago, but, but certainly 20 years ago. Um, and so, you know, do we, do we add so how do we add on that? And then on top of that, you know, maybe an obligatory history of economics class, of, of history of thought class. It's not clear how to do that, okay? Um, in addition, and here I'm speaking particularly, I guess, about the Germans' uh, situation. It's not just limited time budget. It's also limited budgets, period. And in particular, limited sort of... Um, Small, uh, small economics department, right? That's the reality in Germany. We have uh, sort of the, for I guess political reasons, uh, the decision has been made that at nearly every university, you should be able to study nearly every uh, field and also economics. There are very few uh, universities in economics in Germany where you can't study economics. But that means basically given that, uh, you know, the, for political reasons, uh, we, we are going many, many universities have to have some econ professors. There are very few universities, unlike in the US, where you have large departments, right? And then every time that is the case, you basically, you need to think, you know, who, what fields, what sub-disciplines you, you sort of split your professors on, uh, uh, between, right? That's the, that's the issue. And so if, if we take that institution at given, of course, we can dream of a different land where maybe, you know, not every university has an econ department in Germany, but uh, the, then the ones that remain, they have 50 econ professors. And then, of course, it's, it's 
I think it's a, a very different proposition to say we also have these these you know eco departments with fifty professors have a strong history of thought group um, as well. But the, if we don't take if we take the institutions more or less as given as they are, I think the only way to sort of push make a push for a greater role in economic history is basically the push that that I think that has to every sort of subfield in some sense has to sort of uh, fight for is to concentrate it at one or two universities, right? I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe economic hist um, uh, historians of thought work differently, but I work best when I'm around other macroeconomists or frankly other microeconomists. So, so I believe that you need a, 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 a critical mass. And so I think the best way to think about that is if sort of, is there a way to sort of follow the the Düsseldorf model that Düsseldorf, uh, um, what Düsseldorf did in with industrial organization, where they basically said, okay, our faculty, our department is concentrated. We don't have th that many resources, uh, but we concentrate in uh, in industrial economics and competition in competition economics. Okay, and 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 to a certain extent, Ziegen is a, I guess, is a is a way of of sort of uh, doing this for the history of thought, although not everyone here on that panel may agree or may have different opinions on whether that's a successful attempt or not. And I guess that has to be the way the, to go, especially if you also want, you know, a few departments that are strong in economic history, not just history of thought, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, that, maybe that's the way forward if we think about sort of resource allocation within sort of the, the current framework. Although, I mean, given that no one can degree this from above, this was has to come organically from, you know, from, in, from interested uh, research networks. Um, I guess the last point is that um, to the extent that we would, that we, that I would also agree that it would be nice to have more history of economic thought in, in our curricula, both undergraduate and, and uh, the doctoral uh, uh, programs. Um, here's what I would not like to have. I would, not, I would not like to see sort of a quasi philological hermeneutical approach to this. So, so uh, a la, you know, what has that, that old white man or that, that white man actually said exactly? I, I couldn't care less. I, I just, I don't find this particularly interesting. Um, I, I don't care whether Keynes said, you know, what Hicks claimed he said ultimately, or what the post Keynesian said, he said ultimately, why is that interesting? I mean, a lot of these uh, dead old white men, you know, they were confused, like we are confused about things and sort of trying to reconstruct exactly what they said. I don't, I don't find that particularly interesting, but I do think that, uh, you know, a history of, uh, of economic thought can be done differently. And then I find it extremely interesting namely sort of the big ideas, uh, sort of uh, the, the, the history of big ideas, right? So in, 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 to give you an analogy, in, um, in, a, in American college, uh, uh, in American college educations, especially at the upper end, what you all, what often is offered, often from a political science teacher or a historic teacher, is sort of a big, big picture, big ideas class, right? Sort of big historical ideas class where you basically go from, I don't know, uh, the ancient Greece, I mean, this has, a lot of people have criticized that as well as too Eurocentric, too Western centric, and, but that's sort of a side issue. But anyway, sort of you have these big idea classes, these big, these big historical lines classes. And I think if history of economic thought could be that for econ, I think that would be extremely, extremely uh, uh, useful. Um, um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it at that. Maybe one more point uh, when we talked about sort of the the limited but bachelor constraint. I don't, I'm not sure I share Stefan's optimism that students, uh, bachelor students, uh, and maybe we just have different experiences, quite frankly. But that that sort of bachelor students would uh, would you know be ex that would be something to to gain back the bachelor crowd for us in in Germany at least. In the in the U.S. we don't have this problem because mostly. You know, most um, most uh, mostly the business administration, albeit it has uh, that's changed a little bit in the sense that um, uh, in, at some universities business is an undergraduate degree, um, but uh, in many in many it isn't, and I don't think it will become. And so, you know, the, the econ department the econ departments have their students, and we just and in fact, uh, you know, at Notre Dame, even though actually the business school has a, has a business major, uh, you know, our major has been growing continually. And uh, I mean, we, we basically cannot stop it. And some, at some point, we actually talk about a, 
a cap uh, in, in our enrollment because we just can't teach so many students. So we are not exactly in the same situation as you guys across the Atlantic where, where students are running away from you. But I have my doubts that sort of, you know, giving them extensive history of thought lectures would really pull them in, right? At the end of the day, 90% of these students, and I guess this is true even for a lot of uh, economic students in Germany, even though they could do business administration, at the end of the day, these people want to work for a bank or these are very practically minded uh, kids. And I'm not sure all that, might, and don't get me wrong, Stefan, this is a positive statement, not a normative statement. I wish they would be interested in, econo in the history of thought. I'm just not as optimistic as you are about their motives, quite frankly. Um, anyway, maybe I'll leave it at that and, and yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Rudi, for the statement. Uh, Stefan, would you like to answer right away? Or? Yes, if it's, okay. if it's possible. Yeah. Yes, of course. So uh, thank you. And as Rudy said, we should not construct like dichotomous debates. Uh, certainly I agree with many of the things and it, it, the discussion is getting in the fruitful direction I was hoping for. So um, to start with the undergrad <clears throat> education and I fully agree with you that in the US for various reasons you have, uh, you have a very different situation and uh, I mean, colleges are struggling, universities are getting more undergrads than they used to be. You have many more international students, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a sort of a luxury situation. But if we look at the German situation uh, on the undergrad level first, uh, I, did some, I did some work and um, had a look at the stereotypical uh, shares which undergrads study, right? So if we assume that it's like six semesters, 30, uh, roughly speaking, 30 hours per per, uh, per semester, which they're getting taught. So the shares are, they get 20% of business, management, and law. 80%, uh, that is data from FAZ, 80%, uh, 18% are about methods, and 21% are from about micro and micro. Now, what I plea for um, on the undergrad level is a lecture, one, uh, that ideally should be somewhere in the beginning for the reasons I outlined. Um, and since I studied business and since I teach business students, my suggestion very practically would be to deduct those hours from the business hours. Because I have not experienced economic students who are fascinated with business. And as you said, uh, the threshold uh, to migrate to business are low anyway. So very practically speaking, I would try to deduct it from there. I agree with you that we have legal constraints, but haven't been in accreditation um, rounds. I know that those constraints sometimes are softer than we usually assume they are. So that is <clears throat> on the undergrad level. And I think the critical questions are, and you raised them, who are we actually, whom are we actually educating? And what are we actually maximizing? So our qualitative question and a quantitative one. The qualitative question I think is, probably the decisive one. As I see today's undergrads education, we actually educate them to become grad students. Now, very few of them become grad students. Um, many become journalists, many become um, ministry, uh, work as bureaucrats in ministry, oh. many become uh, whatever, as you said, banking uh, specialists. So we are not really, and we are educating them to be able to enter grad school. So I think if we think of the, of the job description in that broader sense, uh, as I mentioned it, I think a bro uh, history and methodology and uh, philosophy in those homeopathic doses, which I propose, uh, I think can make them, um, again, more proud. And as I said, hopefully also more um, sticky um, as opposed to running away to law, sociology, political science, business uh, or the like. So this is my can quality. Can I in here? Can yeah, I come sure. in here? So otherwise I'll forget what I wanted to say. Sure. So uh, is that okay, Stefan? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, look, I actually, I'm actually a, a, in agreement with you. I'd love to take some stuff away from, from, our call, uh, from uh, the business administration guys. The more we take away from them, uh, you, will, you will get me, you had me there basically. <laughs> you had me at taking it away from the BWL guys. Uh, yeah. No, but uh, uh, you know, uh, kidding aside, um, um, yeah, good luck, uh, you know, at a university. I, I mean, I've, albeit uh, uh, shortly, but I've been at a, 
you know, in a, in a mixed faculty um, uh, with BWL colleagues at German University. Um, and uh, good luck taking anything away from them. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you try and I, I wish you good luck. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, I'm totally with you. I'm also with you um, in, the, in the sense that uh, I think it's a mistake to, to educate undergraduates uh, towards grad school. Indeed, that's, what, uh, that's exactly, and in that sense, the situation in Germany and the US really is different, right? Because that's something we don't do in the US. In the US, we do the, if anything, the opposite. We don't educate them for grad school. We tell them to go to the math department if you want to go to grad school, basically. Uh, and so we, we educate them to be citizens in some sense, educated citizens uh, that have a broad knowledge of economics. Um, and so, uh, but you're right. In Germany, that's not the case. And I'd like to see more of that. And I agree, actually, that history of economic thought could at least play some role into that. I think more has to change, I think, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you really wanted to do that, then you have to go a little bit more the US way and say, you know, probably take away a little bit from the business class, even more from the business classes. But that makes it even more difficult uh, in the internal faculty struggles. Um, but, you know, then you want them to have a political science class, a sociology class, perhaps a philosophy of science class, et cetera, et cetera. Something that you get if you sort of do a normal US education where you, you declare a major in your sophomore year. And mm -hmm. so you have at least the first year, but also the sophomore year, the second year, you know, to do much more what we call in Germany a Studium Generale. And so, mm -hmm. um, um, I, look, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a big fan of the US undergraduate education system, the liberal arts system. Uh, at least uh, as in, in the upper echelons, I still I think it still works. It, it's basically the only place in the world with few exceptions that is truly still living the Humboldt ideal in a way that Germany actually isn't anymore, the, where it came from, right? And so, so you, you have me there. I, I'm just less optimistic that sort of given the way, uh, the, the, given the realities on the ground that, that, you will, that it will be so easily implementable. That's, I guess that's all I'm saying. No, no, I, I don't say it's easy. I just say it's a way, right? And I wanted just to show that the hours which we try to deduct from somebody, for example, business, uh, are very few out of the total curriculum, which uh, in the six semesters people cover. But I agree with you that a move towards the US uh, uh, undergrad education, as you described, it would be a benefit. And that brings me actually to my larger point, which is, as you said, um, the resources which are needed to, uh, to, to teach, right? Um, so in the very short run, nobody in this crowd, and I see many friends, are dreaming of a chair dedicated to history economic thought in Germany. I mean, that would be utopian, right? But what we do dream of, and we have Michael Burda among us who did that at Humboldt. I would support that, by the way. I think well, we should have, we should have a bunch of chairs, in fact, for history of economic thought. If that could be, if that could make it into tomorrow's newspaper, I would be very happy uh, as a result of the debate. Um, but again, Bulgarians are sort of humble and I'm a Hayekian and we have today's Hayek's passing. So let me stress humility. So what I really hope for in the short run are agents, right? So Lehrbeauftragte who do the job in faculties which have interest in that, but don't have the, uh, that don't have the, um, the chair they have to take away from labor or uh, international trade or whatever. Now in the mid run, however, I hope that Jan, you and I agree that the German system with those silo like chairs has to change anyway. So in the mid run, I dream of a structural transformation of those departments anyway. And that would basically mean that somebody teaching history of thought would be Sorry about, for the non-German speakers, but I'll try to do it as best as possible. So something like Entfriste der Mittelbau. So it doesn't have to be a full professor. It has to be somebody who is passionate about teaching and who has a tenured non-professorial job and who can do that. Um, so we, take, we can take one, we double you three big positions, split it into two or three, let's say two, and make small positions of that kind um, I think you are too modest, honestly. I think you are too modest. You have to have you have to have chaired professorships. That's the the, the the university system in Germany is 
is structured around those and the only one who counts at the end of the day are chair professorships. And uh, I, I think the best idea is to capture a department the way, you know, Siegen has done this, the way uh, uh, Düsseldorf has done this uh, uh, um, with IO. And uh, you have to be smart about it, okay? That you have to find an opening where, you know, there's a department restructuring. And, and the, the, the funny thing or the interesting thing, if you actually look at the Düsseldorf development, Düsseldorf has been so successful. They started out with an extremely tiny department, again, focused on, on competition policy, but now they grew. They have all these Stiftungsprofessoren because uh, a sort of third party finance professorships um, because they were successful. So the resources will come if you're good at something, um, I think. Um, and, and so I, I, just having, you know, people uh, doing this sort of uh, at low pay, you know, with, without protection from a big dog uh, or two big dogs, I think, I think you are you're you're setting these people up for failure. I think you get you got to be bold. Um, you have to have a, a group, one or two, somewhere in Germany. Uh, you know, there's 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 among you. I see a few that are prof professorable, happy or whatever they call it in Germany, professorable in, in in German. I don't know how you translate this in English, professorable. Uh, and uh, and you know, there has to be some kind of uh, lobbying, I guess together with other people that can help you there uh, to try to build this. I think that's the only way you're gonna, you're gonna do it. Just having some lectures here and there that are kind of lonely um, and overworked. I'm not sure that that will work despite, I believe you are right. They have a lot of passion. Um, and, and so that will compensate for a lot, but uh, I'm just not optimistic that they will, will have anything to say, given the system is set up where basically you're only a human being once you are once you are a professor. Unfortunately, that's the way in Germany still. Well, I fully agree with that. And that of course would be the first best. I mean, no doubt about that. Um, and that was actually my last point. Uh, like the, the long run hope which I have is the German department, small as they are, as you mentioned, would actually realize that not every German econ department can be born. Right. I agree with that, yes. And so that is my like really long-term vision that uh, Departments, as you said, like Siegen, will realize that the only way uh, to succeed and to prosper is to dare to be different, as, as Buchanan would say. So, mm -hmm. but again, I cannot shape that. Uh, and the youngsters you see here uh, cannot shape that. We do whatever uh, we can. And what I want to underscore is, again, in the short run, I hope for adjuncts. In the mid run, I hope for some endowed chair. Indeed, that would be the way to go, but as you know, the culture of endowed chairs in Germany is a little bit baby-like. Mm -hmm. And in the long run, I do hope that departments will realize that we cannot make it the bond way. Uh, and then, then those would be like biotops of uh, PPE. And basically we have PPE already, philosophy, politics, and economics all, the, all across the country, including Dusseldorf. Um, but my hope is that it's not only PPE. PPE is a wonderful niche, uh, but those are different types of students. I mean, many of them are here uh, online. Um, I really hope that for the econ students proper, we will find in those non-utopian, short-run, mid-term, long-run perspective, that we'll also find for them some exposure, right? The PPE students already either self-organize it or get it anyway. Whereas my hope is that, um, um, the econ students proper should also get it. And a last point on that, um, the history of economic thought or history of economics as we usually call it community is very vivid, um, including uh, people like Arash age, my age, we have Beatrice Cherrier here among us. So um, we exist, uh, we try to um, publish as well as that is possible, we try to organized sessions at the ASSA, which are always well attended. Um, and so I do hope that in the, let's say in 10 years from now, what you pleaded for might be reality, but um, I think it's a long way to, to go realistically speaking. Mm -hmm. And I hope tonight and discussions like this one might get us somewhat closer to that first best which you described. Um, I have a question for, for Stefan. Um, um, I have a f I found a, a nice quote from Robert Heilbronner from 1979 already, 
where he complains that uh, even in his day, uh, the history of economic thought curriculum has been condensed to just one course in one semester, and it's just uh, not enough, and, and, and he goes on about this. Um, so it's, it's a process that's going on for decades now, that uh, history of economic, economic thought is a bit marginalized in the curricula. Um, do you think uh, there have been strategic mistakes been made by historians of economic thought themselves, or do you see uh, this group just as victims of a, of a broader development? Well, that's a very important question. Now, Hal Bronner, of course, is biased himself, having written one of the most beautiful books and being a Schumpeter student, so uh, he certainly has stakes in that game, but certainly it's a long um, it's a long decline, uh, and uh, in the U.S., uh, the Center for the History of Political Economy at Duke is basically the last place we, where you can get it, uh, where you can get uh, historians of economics at one place in the uh, in the cluster type of way, which Rudy pleaded for, and we have Bruce Caldwell also online. Now, um, certainly. Um, Historians of economics have also um, committed mistakes. Um, in Germany, but Ecke pleaded that we stop the German case. The problem, of course, is that all those questions certainly are specific in a, in a context, but certainly history of economics is not a substitute for theory. And um, perhaps historians of economics um, didn't always um, show that what they were really doing and did not convince their colleagues. Second, I think it is a, I call it a sin, but I'm not sure if that's the precise term, but that's how I feel it. It's a sin to practice history of economics because you dislike today's economics, because that's basically the best way to get enemies in the world out there full of brilliant economists. And if you bash them all the time, and if you tell them how stupid they are and how smart you are as a heterodox guy, um, that is not useful at all. So you should say that you're a heterodox, heterodox economist or whatever, but you should not say that you're a historian. You're harming history that way. And many historians of economics, at least in the past, I don't see that in the, in the young generation, but at least in the past, that has been a motivation, right? To um, say, well, I want to show the smart guys like Rudy that they're stupid by doing history. That's a great, that has, certainly done a damage to, to history of economics. And of course, economics itself has changed. As I briefly mentioned, that golden generation of people like uh, Hicks and Hayek and, uh, and uh, um, well, up to the lecture series at Stanford uh, also had a chance to get into existence because Ken Arrow was uh, also a historian of economics apart from everything else he was. But of course, they could do theory and history and they could publish in any journal, right? So today you cannot put a history of thought paper in a top journal, unlike it's the JPE and it's something cute about Chicago, but anything cute about Chicago has already been said. So even the JPE wouldn't probably take you. So those things have changed. And again, I do believe that the major mistake of historians of economics might have been not to explain why we have a reason to exist and to do it out of, the, of that ideological let's bash and hate the so-called mainstream perspective, which I think has really created unnecessary enemies. I would agree with that. I, but I mean, not, not in terms of a personal experience. I think you guys are by now too, too rare to, to meet many of you. So, but, but, I, guess it is, I, but I, I guess this is exactly right. If you do economic his, uh, the history of economic thought out of spite for modern economics, then I think this is exactly the wrong reason uh, uh, why you do it. And again, I would, would sort of reiterate what I said in my introduction, and I saw already in the chat some, and maybe we can come to that, um, sort of uh, um, um, disagreement. Uh, if you view history of economic thought as mainly a discipline of philology, uh, of hermeneutics, uh, I, I think this is the wrong approach. You will, at least you won't get allies uh, 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 with modern e e economists, um, if that's what you wish 
if you if you don't care, if you want allies in the German department or in the in the history department, then that then then that that's the that's uh, that's okay. Um, but if you want uh, your sort of your practicing e economics colleagues um, uh, to to sort of yeah to take you seriously or to to be interested in what you're doing, that's the right word. I think you you got to you got to stop this. These endless debates, what a certain economic economists in the past um, um, uh, said, and you know, also, but and and, and um, uh, yeah, exactly what they exactly meant. So that this 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 sort of the joke that the the runs around sort of mainstream modern economists, although you are right, we shouldn't use these words, is basically you know uh, sort of what Keynes really said. Are you kidding me? I don't care, you know. Um, and so uh, so you know, it's it's interesting what. I find it extremely interesting that so many different things came out of what Keynes said, but I, I don't, I, I, I cannot, I can, just cannot be interested in in these endless debates of what he really said. So what if he said many things that can be, you know, that can be interpreted in many different ways? Isn't that a good thing? I would say. Why, why do we even have to fight uh, about these things? Anyway, so if 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 that's if that's how you build the economic history of economic thought, I think you're not going to get any allies. Um, but it, as I said, if, if it's about the main ideas, if you sort of really, what are the main ideas? What, what are the thoughts that are, you know, sort of that go through from, you know, that, is, that, that are generated by someone and then go through maybe until the very day, even though we don't really know. And what are the, the crisscrosses? What are the connections between these big ideas? If that's uh, your idea of economic history, I think you will get, you will get uh, sort of practicing uh, um, modern economists uh, uh, on board. And so, in that sense, I would also slightly disagree with, uh, with what uh, with something that Stefan said at the very beginning. And there were most of the stuff I actually agree with uh, uh, he said. But this one, I was a bit uh, I'm hesitant. At least when he said, students need to feel that economists are human. Yeah, maybe. But uh, at a at a at a sort of a teacher professor level, that is might be true. Okay, but I don't care all that much what you know, what kind of human being Keynes was or what kind of human being Adam Smith was, honestly. It, that's not so interesting to me. That's, I mean, that might be fun bedtime reading, but as an economist, I don't know. Why, why, is, why is Keynes more interesting than, you know, other historical figures? So that, I don't know, you know, uh, me, I'm a completely unremarkable person. You know, no one needs to know. People should read my Jamie's, you know, they want to learn something from me, but they don't need to know anything about you know my biography or anything. And frankly, most most economists bigger up the chain, food chain from me. You know, if you actually meet them, they're rather dull people, to be honest. I don't know that we need to know them on a personal level as human beings. Um, and so I'm interested in their ideas. I'm not interested in you know um, in their private lives, quite frankly. So this whole humanization of economists. And pr professors as teachers should be approachable. So that for sure that that but that's a, to me a, a very different a different notion. But you know, do I need to know, you know, what Ken Arrow was in his private life? I don't know. But even, but even if uh, it may be uninteresting for students that Keynes was a bit of a flamboyant person. Um, Maybe it would be interesting. Sure, we for have them. the Keynes Hayek rap video, right? That's useful. <laughs> yeah, right. That's useful to get the, the students' interest, and yeah. I'm all for that. Uh, yeah, sure. but 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 still, I mean, uh, isn't it? I mean, if I look at modern macro textbooks, uh, they go straight to the models or straight to the empirical research strategy, and there's very little historical context there. Um, but wouldn't it be much easier for students to to understand, for example, Keynesian macroeconomics, even? New Keynesian macroeconomics, if they have a have an idea where it comes from historically, uh, if they know in which yeah. context Keynes uh, thought about his uh, ideas about involuntary unemployment. No, well, I mean, okay, I agree with you. <laughs> Keynes is a is sort of a you know, it's a flamboyant person. It might be might be fun to have a box there. I, I'm not disagreeing with you. But now that you're talking about new new Keynesian economics, right? Mike Woodford. I mean, God bless him. I love Mike. But you know he's a rather dull person. <laughs> yeah, like, sure. You can have a beer with Mike, but there's nothing. I don't know what a box should be about. Uh, you know about Mike Woodford, honestly. It's not <laughs> and again, I love Mike. Don't take this as a. <laughs> no, I, I, I won't go to the persons. But I mean, if you, I guess you would understand, for example, uh, um, even things like the breakdown of the Phillips curve. You would understand this as a student probably. More, 
much easier if you not know much too much too, too many things about the persons involved but if you know the historical context in which they okay, I agree with their that. theories and, oh, and but, but that if i may that of course is something that shouldn't only be taught in history of thoughts classes this is something uh, that should be if you go into my macroeconomic lecture and I talk about the Phillips curve, you will learn that, of course, right? So, of course, you will learn about the idea that people thought this was a structural relationship and then, and then it was, when it, and then it stopped being, uh, in, in, and it really never was, quite frankly. And so that then we, I talk about this idea of, you know, statistical relationships versus structural relationships. And of course, that, if, if that's what you, uh, that, what, what you want, of course, but that's not really knowing about the, the persons involved, mm. but about the sort of the historical situations yeah. when these yeah. concepts came up. Well, I even give my American students uh, the, the, the famous uh, Chancellor Schmidt quote, you know, about the, mm. about the, uh, the unemployment and, uh, and, uh, and inflation, right? I'd rather have 8% uh, infla uh, inflation than 8% unemployment or something like that. Um, and so I even tell that to my American students. And, and so, yeah, I give them these contexts. So that, that, but I think that should already happen in a good, in a good uh, subject uh, letter, quite frankly. Um, would you, but would you say that it does happen? I don't think you're generalizable in that way, right? So I've, you study philosophy, as you said, and uh, uh, I hope you were generalizable, but, uh, and I don't want to speak about my personal education, but uh, again, at least in Germany, uh, I would doubt that uh, people, and again, the difference is probably a small conceptual clarification could help. Of course, there is a difference between a biography and intellectual biography. I mean, many of us here in the room are also interested in the biographies of, say, Keynes and Hayek, but the intellectual biography is indispensable if you want to understand how Keynes wanted to rescue capitalism, right? So uh, not being interested in his private life, even though the demarcation line is probably difficult. Um, but you cannot, um, I think you can motivate students much better to understand what he was doing if you told him about, if you told them about him, if you told them, well, was he really a socialist? Was he a liberal? Was, what was he trying to rescue? So that, that, that could motivate them to really understand that birth of modern macro, not the question of his sexual life or things like that. I mean, well, those I agree with you. I try to uh, tell our our friends from the young liberals in Germany that who always claim that Keynes was a socialist. I, I tell, always tell them Keynes wanted to save capitalism, not was not against capitalism, right, Paul? <laughs> and we should so. put that into macro, right? So I don't say that all history economics should be taught by historians of economics in a history economics class. Right, I agree with that. I ideally, fully agree with that. Yes. Ideally, anybody who teaches economics should contextualize. But since not yes. that many people do, and since we believe in division of labor, and we have, since we have become so specialized, I think it could be outsourced uh, in such a class. If everybody did, uh, this would be a non-agenda, right? I think you might want to have both. I mean, but if you have colleagues that sort of specialize in this, you know, you also get a, maybe more of a culture. I mean, and again, the German situation with the Lehrstuhls, with the chair system, which has these very isolated units where often people don't talk to each other. But, you know, if, if uh, in a more department system, which, you know, maybe Germany is, is, is ultimately going in the limit, um, so. you know, you, you, will you will have hopefully have some spillovers, right? And if you have sort of an economic historian that, that over lunch will tell you these stories, then maybe you start putting them in your lecture uh, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And that would be the best. Wouldn't that be the best of both worlds? Uh, um, if you ask me if I want to work in a Duke-like cluster of historians of economics in Leipzig, well, of course the answer is yes, right? Yeah. So I'm allowed to dream of such a world, uh, no doubt. And I go regularly to Duke and it's a, it's a gigantic pleasure, right? But, um, but again, okay. to, to make the historians of economics case, we don't need, at the moment at least, or well, realistically speaking in the, in the short run, we don't need Duke. We don't need five historians of economics at a cluster, which will probably never happen in the next 20 years, because the community is so lively and is so virtually connected. We have a history of economic society in the US, we have a European society, so that collaboration, which used to be important locally, and certainly to a certain, to a certain extent still is important locally, we can handle uh, through, I mean, the societies, and of course now in the Zoom age, 
uh, even uh, more so uh, virtually. So that is not, I think, I mean, that is that would be wonderful to have, but I think it's so beyond the possible that, uh, again, making those small steps institutionally would be what I what I would dare to hope for. I think can we I, should. Uh, all... can, I, can I ask something? Can we ask one of the audience? I actually would like to. Uh, I would be curious to hear from Bruce how how the day to day sure. interaction is at Duke, by the way. How that how that works, where you know, sort of normal econ department, quote unquote sits next to uh, uh, a big and very famous economic his, uh, uh, history of thought and philosophy of economics group. And it, how is there any daily interaction and what does it look like, if I can? I don't want to put you on sure. the spot, obviously, but I would be extremely curious to see. So um, the center raises all of its money from the outside. Uh, Duke pays my salary, uh, but all of the money for the fellowship program, our summer institute, our lecture series, and the other things that we do, workshops, etc., is raised from private funds. So I think it's a model that is perhaps difficult to reproduce in, uh, in Europe, uh, uh, for sure. Uh, perhaps a little more able to happen in the United States, although, um, yeah, our, our center has actually been funded by the federal government from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, we get money from the uh, Koch Foundation and we get money from uh, George Soros. So we, it, it, it's an ideologically diverse uh, set of funders, all of whom see the value of uh, economists knowing a little bit about the history of their discipline. Um, so uh, uh, I think it's a unique case. I mean, what we're, we're a, cog, a, a, a cog in the, in the, in the, in the machine. We're trying to uh, help people who are interested in the history of economics come and, and, uh, and get a little better at their trade and hopefully uh, be able to get a position. But like Stefan, I think there's a short run game, a middle run game, and a long run game. Luckily, I won't have to worry about the long run game, but, uh, but, but you folks, uh, I'm, I'm always happy to see so, so many young people who are interested in the field. And it's, uh, and I, and I will just say, I mean, I, I think uh, if you, if you, provide the field, if students can take the field, that, that to me is the, is the starting point. The reason it's, it's difficult is that if people retire and no one replaces them, they can't even take it. But if you just allow students to have the choice, a lot of the, the best students, I don't care if, yeah, I don't care about the students who want to go out and, and you know, make a lot of money and they don't care about history of thought, I, fine, don't be in my class. But, but the ones who are really intellectually curious, uh, often sometimes the same people who are quite quite sophisticated technologic, uh, technically, uh, you know, to have those sorts of students in the class are great and they seem to get a lot out of the class. So um, yeah, that's, that's true. That's true for US private universities. The German public universities don't quite have that luxury. But I was more curious about your day to day interaction if they are at all with people like Pat Bayer, uh, 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 you know, Bianchi, uh, Cosmin Elud, or sort of, sort of my peers you know, of standard economics. Is there any interaction there with, with your group and them? Or is this like you just meet in faculty meetings? Uh, mostly just in faculty meetings. And, and, and frankly, I, I don't think that we're all that uh, unusual. <laughs> it's only that we're a much smaller group. But the macro group uh, sticks with the, themselves and the micro groups. I mean, it's a siloed uh, kind of department the way that many large research departments are. Uh, we're all cordial. Uh, they, they, uh, but uh, each group protects its turf and we're the smallest group. So you can imagine how that, how that often turns out uh, in terms of being able to, uh, to gain a, a names on resources or, or lines for, for hiring. That, that, that is a challenge for us, but it's, it's always been on a very cordial level. Of course, we're in the American South, Rudy. So things are much more cordial. Okay, I think we should uh, open up the floor for more questions uh, from the audience. And I think the first on the list is uh, Ibanka Anon, if I pronounced that correctly. I hope I did moderately at least. Yeah, no, you did, you did perfectly. Can everyone hear me okay? My internet is a little unstable. Okay, wonderful. Um, so I have a question for both of you. First of all, I'm so glad I caught wind of this event on Twitter. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on 
when in a student's career is really the best time for them to become exposed to history of economics. And I would love to give just like a few personal anecdotes. So for me, um, I was an economics major as an undergraduate, uh, was feeling frustrated by, you know, the seemingly non-humanistic nature of it. Now that I'm much older, I know that it's because I want to be a humanist. Um, and so I was able to take a history of economic thought course as a sophomore. Um, and that's when I realized I would I want to become a historian and a historian of economics. Um, I also have a friend right now who is doing their PhD um, in econ at Stanford, and he's now participating in those um, seminars that they're hosting, which uh, a few people in this seminar um, have been presenting at. And he, you know, is going to be a social scientist. He wants to be an economist. And I think for him, that was the perfect time for him to become introduced to history of economics. And we're having uh, really enriching and intriguing discussions with each other. Um, so I, I really wanted to hear from both of you, um, is there an ideal time that something like this can be offered to students in their journey? Can I jump in? So thank you for the question and thank you for mentioning Stanford. Uh, I'll say a couple of things about Stanford at that moment. It's, I think it's a good way. So I think, again, I was speaking about those small courses uh, as a first step. I do believe that um, either as a freshman or as a sophomore, I think in the beginning of your economics education, um, you don't quite know what he really picked, right? So uh, in the German system, you start, you just go to university at 18, there is no, nothing like college, and you have picked something with a curious abbreviation, three, three letters, and you don't really know what that is, right? And so I do believe that um, we have to motivate students that that was the right choice. And so an undergrad course in the beginning, which more focus on persons, debates, as Rudy said, uh, the, the great books uh, type of way. Now, and I do believe that on the, on the grad students level, um, as we do it at Stanford, which is purely voluntary. Uh, so we contacted all grad students and we have a session every two weeks and um, we have somewhere between 15 and 40 uh, attendants depending on the probably the, the topic right um, I think that can also help um, to um, reflect while you're doing your heavily technical courses to reflect what you're actually want to do in your thesis for each for which in the US you have those uh, years right so it can be but that should be a different course. I think that should be a course heavily on history of economic analysis or history of economic theory, if you want, right? So I, I would do the two courses uh, with a different motivation, but also with a different content. Mm -hmm. At Stanford, we are struggling with finding that because again, what do people know? What, they, what do they want? I mean, it's, it's a process, but it's, it's a fun to calibrate uh, the course. Um, Deirdre has the second on the list. You're muted. Uh, there, okay, I'm on. Okay, there we are. On, on, uh, the year before I started graduate school at Harvard, having been an undergraduate at Harvard College, Harvard, in one of its contributions to uh, the barbarization of economics, had abandoned the history of thought course. When I was at Chicago on the faculty, George, George uh, um, Stigler, who taught the required graduate history of thought course, led the charge against the history of thought, which I tried to stop, but I couldn't. So it, it, I, look, a long time ago, Axel uh, Lanhofen made, I think, a very good argument for the history of thought, which is that any, any subject, chemistry, history, whatever, um, music for that matter, is like a branching tree. And at the branch points, there are choices made. And those choices determine what the higher branches are able to do. 
And of course, <laughs> the choice of those, bran those branchings off in the tree are made, as has been said, in a historical context. This is the important point about sophisticated intellectual history of the Johns Hopkins and Cambridge sort, that you've got to know what's going on at those nodes, at those branching points. Now, what Axel said is this, and I'd be interested in how either of you or all of us feel about this. He said, if you find when you get out to the end of one branch in, in labor economics or economic history or, or anything you want to name, that you're in a degenerating research program, which I think, well, let's take, I, I don't want to in, 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 insult people, but there are lots of them in any scientific field. As he said, to know what to do next, it's very good to know the previous nodes, the previous branching points. Because then you can go back and say, for example, was Keynes right? Was it a sound decision on his part to abandon completely free markets as though that's what they were? But anyway, completely free markets in favor of management from the top, mainly by, by John Maynard Keynes. And then you can go the other way. So how do you feel about Axel's argument? Woody, would you like to start? Yeah, I'm not convinced. Um, I think this is one perspective on a development of a field. And, and it's an interesting one, uh, but I don't think it's sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's the only one or the necessary one. Um, you know, e e economists are for better or for worse, um, mostly worried or mostly driven by substantive questions like, you know, literally like, you know, is the, um, is a training program in Kentucky, uh, you know, does that increase uh, employment for black sure. women? Stuff like sure. that. Sure. Okay? Yeah. That's, that's sort of the most, that's a, or macroeconomists, you know, should the Fed, uh, when should the Fed start uh, 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 raising interest rates, right? Is the, or a current debate to re literally take a debate of today or, to, or these days, you know, is the Biden stimulus plan uh, uh, too much will lead to overheating and, you know, what are the arguments pro and con? It's really these kind of things. And I don't know that Keynes has, studying Keynes or, you know, studying these branches has us a lot to t tell uh, us, um, has a lot to tell us about precisely these questions. Well, I, 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 I think you're, I, I think you're quite wrong about that, but, uh, yeah, but, it, it, but, we, but, we but, have to disagree. but, but no, 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 wait, no, wait, wait. What you just said is that, is that, is that, uh, of, I agree, and I agree with you, that practical policy questions are often not of a character that uh, would be helped by this, but theory questions are. I, I think the whole theory of, say, a stimulus program, a, a, what amounts to a Keynesian stimulus program, which is the idea that journalists and other practical people and politicians have in their mind, is <laughs> you can rethink in a way you can't if you're off on this one branch where you've, you've been assuming for half a century that that node went in the right direction. Here's a more here's a more concrete example. Can I can I, can I jump in? Can I chime in here? I disagree. Sure. I, I I really don't think that you know debates about Keynes versus Hayek or ISLM and and what the IS the IS curve looks like or the LM curve or whatever the AD curve looks like yeah, yeah. are not going to help us. We need to think. No. You really need to think. Here here's where you need to get into the weeds and where you have to be sort of really modern about things. For yeah, example, yeah. you really need to know if you want to assess stimulus packages and their efficacy, you really uh -huh. need to be very serious about the wealth distribution, the underlying wealth distribution, the underlying distribution of debt, the underlying mm -hmm. MPC distribution, that's what it really is. So just to give, uh, to, to put a name on this, 
uh, what people are trying to do with a business cycle, distribution of business cycle models in the last maybe 10 years. Mm -hmm. I, I really disagree that, uh, that sort of in terms of, in terms of really quantitatively informing the debate, uh, you want to go back all that far into history. Rudy, I think, may I jump in? I think you're right within a paradigm. Yeah, that's, that's the point. I think if we hope, then any one of us here will set up a new paradigm, which of course is not a very modest hope, but uh, we nevertheless hope to. Then it makes sense to go back to see where did the old paradigm start off? What okay. were alternative roads not taken, which I could exploit for being somebody who uh, really sets up something new. And again, the question okay, of what I, is I agree, I agree with you, but most practical economists of, of today are not interested in setting up the new paradigm. Well, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, not sure, oh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, at I'm, least most of my colleagues. I'm not, and most of my colleagues uh, aren't. And so we are interested in, you know, I, is, is what, is the, what is the effect of the Biden stimulus program? But if we say that DSGE, let's try to take an example, right? So if we say that DSGE was something like a new paradigm, right? I think you would be proud to be the person to have set it up, right? So if we frame paradigm in those practical terms, but that could, studying the 30s and the debates, it's not just Keynes, but also people like Robinson and others could have helped, right? To move away from real business cycles and towards DSGE. So I think that's what it remains by the, by the branches and by studying how we went and what alternative not exploited, um, branches we could take. And I think anybody of us would be happy to have been the first DSGE uh, guy. But for that, and those are those low hanging sure fruits. I would call it a paradigm. I mean, sort of, well, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the Neo-Keynesian synthesis, if you want to call it, which is the DSGE models, they were, um, they were response, obviously, to the question of why monetary policy has any real effect at all, yes. right? But that is entirely data driven in some sense. I mean, we, we have statistical methods that, that tell us that monetary policy has a real effects, small ones. In that sense, the real business cycle wasn't all that bad, by the way. And the real business cycle, by the way, was an entirely necessary revolution, I would say. It, need, it needed, we needed to get rid of the, the, ten, the ten, thousand equation, equation Keynesian models and their clutter okay, that, that helped us not understand anything. And so the real business cycle model was exactly the right thing at the time. I agree with you at the time, because it needed to show us the genius of the real business cycle model is to actually teach us that aggregate fluctuations can at least in part be equilibrium phenomena. That's the genius of it. And, 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 and so and that, I think that's a really, that is a truly scientific revolution of course, that it's wrong to say that all aggregate fluctuations are efficient and equilibrium phenomena, but that they can in part be, that's the contribution, the intellectual contribution of the RBC models or the, the RBC school. And I think that's absolutely important. Of course, taking it to the extreme then, of course, that was, uh, uh, that was too much. Uh, and again, but most people with the exception of Prescott and Kittler themselves probably never took it quite to the extreme. So. Well, I agree with you. But um, you, you didn't have to do it the data-driven way. I mean, if you study the way the things Arash is doing with the 1920s and 30s, and their debates about uh, neutral money, uh, multiple equilibria, that could have been informative, right? So I agree with you that it could come out of data, but it could also come out of studying old, old histories, uh, sorry, old theories. And if you really penetrate the old theories as Arash does, uh, it can you, it can get you precisely there. That's what, I mean. It, that's true, otherwise... but it also can potentially hinder you. Sure, As I sure. said, it was necessary to get rid of the the hundred and five hundred equation sure. uh, 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 models. I mean, they, they, that was a, uh, uh, I don't know what what um, what dying paradigms uh, or degenerate paradigms uh, Professor McCloskey has in mind, but that was a degenerate. I mean, that was objectively a degenerate pa paradigm and we needed to get rid of it. And uh, well, we got rid of it in, a, in a, I think in a way that that was entirely fruitful, um, not in a way that uh, I believe that the real business cycle model is a good description of reality, far being from it, but it has aspects of it. 
and, uh, um, and sort of opens up thought horizons that I don't think we had before, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the economic historians will tell me, uh, um, uh, will tell me otherwise, the history, historians of thought. Um, Hendrik Ritter is the next one on the question list. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I want to concur um, Professor Bachmann on a very special point. Um, working at one of the few institutions in, in Germany that has um, about 300 to 400 economists being the Federal Ministry of Finance, um, I can absolutely ensure that the, it, the most important point uh, to understand at this moment for us is how do these programs like the Biden program or the German program, you know, uh, Scholz Bazooka, how do they work? Um, and while I loved my um, history of economic science and history of economic thought class um, with uh, Professor Schrödi, our Magdeburg, um, I definitely had too few macro courses. Yeah? Um, and um, of course, we had the chance during this crisis, and Professor Bachmann knows very well because he was one of the guys we got in contact to, um, we have the option to get into touch with experts and try to um, try to elaborate on current programs and on data and so forth. But of course, um, last year in, in, in March and April, we didn't have the time to get into contact with anybody that could be relevant. Um, and of course, from the, from the commentary side, um, and this is a rather German problem, I think, um, in, in Germany, we, we are still uh, very strongly influenced um, by older paradigms, still um, having current researchers being aligned to several groups, and I don't think this helps at all. Um, um, and for for the students to be trained in a way that they will be able to to grasp what is currently currently um, happening, and that they are able to make um, insightful economic advices. And I think most of the economic students will end up at some kind of economic advisor, be it in a political institution, be it in a private institution. Um, and they have to be able to, to, to grasp how the current environment will evolve and how policy in this environment will, will uh, affect uh, actual outcomes. Um, and I, I would say every part of the curriculum should be analyzed and how does it fit into this target? How does it fit into this aim? Um, and um, then, of course, I think it's important to have an idea on where do our current paradigms come from. Um, but it's, I don't think that is something that has to be done in the first three, uh, three years, actually, because until that point, most students still have to learn the language at all. How do economists think? How, why do economists think this way? Of course, but um, we don't have to teach all the history that led us there. Um, but again, of course, at some advanced point um, that can come in, that should come in. Um, but at the lower levels, I think um, having a strong, a strong um, grasp of the most important techniques, what are incentives, what are opportunity costs and how does modern macro work is the most important part of the curriculum. Can I briefly reply? Yeah, sure. So Hendrik, I uh, fully agree that I wouldn't put historians of economics in charge of uh, a BMF, right? So <laughs> uh, that is, uh, I mean, that's not our job description. But since we know each other and since you know the youngsters, which every summer in the previous years we try to bring, so it's a connected to NUS, uh, uh, an academy for high school students who are at the brink of entering university, you saw that the kids and the, um, you know, that, um, let me call it somewhat abstract, uh, but certainly hunger for, to learn what economics is. And they did find the BMF experience always extremely interesting. At the same time, they were trying uh, in the other courses which we were doing to understand the qualitative or conceptual tools, right? So because otherwise, I mean, we try to teach them uh, in your, uh, with your colleagues, what is a tax uh, projection and what, how do you, how do you do all that? But as Deidre McCloskey would say, it's the concepts first 
and only then do you, you have a qualitative understanding of what's going on and, and only then can you do meaningful empirical work, right? And so my point is not that historians of economics are something like the Eierlegende Wollmüchse, which can be in charge of public finance. Um, but for, for example, to, 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 to make a small case, I think the, the German tradition of public finance, which died out just as history economics did, I think could be the study of public finance in the German tradition as a part of history economics in the, in, in the German specificity of economics could be helpful to, to motivate people understand why economists care so much, cared, used to care so much about the state, about taxation and spending way before Keynes. So that could be helpful to motivate them to go precisely in the job direction which you picked. And that goes, as you know, until the, in, into the 17th century, mm. right? As far as I see, Eki Köder from Freiburg is the next one. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that you can uh, he hear me. Um, yep. I just wanted to address the audience that there is a very interesting uh, side discussion going on in the chat box here on Zoom. And, um, well, I do not feel um, uh, competent enough to uh, all sum it up. I just wanted to make a certain point, which is... Um, to go a little bit backwards uh, in the in the in the whole talk here, um, and, I, and I wanted to stress that um, you know where is evolution coming from in, uh, in economic science, and evolution is coming from of course from the different method that um, um, economic science is using. You know from empirical research, you know that 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 uh, you know informs um, theory. Uh, theory is uh, changed a bit, and then you know we find new empirical evidence, and we go on, which is uh, perfect, which is perfect. But the but the point is um, is that um, uh, history of economic thought can broaden the set of principal alternatives for theoretical assumptions that are uh, or that can be tested. You know, and how can you know how how we might find further progress. And I just want to give two examples, which is. Uh, my point of view, a very good case why we need a certain, um, well, history of economics class, uh, uh, thought class for uh, PhD candidates, for example, which is on the one side in, uh, in monetary policy, for example, you know, most, most PhDs, most, most economists, you know, they, they basically start out in our days with Mike Woodford, but there is a long story that uh, has been told before Mike Woodford uh, was on this earth. And, um, I think that you know very brilliant minds that um, um, you know that 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 who made their own contributions for uh, the theoretical development of uh, um, macro, uh, for example, Van Kellum, for example, you know they were um, very much influenced um, by history of economic thought, you know, by being at UVA, um, hanging out there with um, Leland Jaeger in the beginning of the 1960s, you know, when he was compiling this uh, brilliant book of In Search of a Monetary Constitution with Milton Friedman, James Buchanan, and so many other people. Inside. So, so I just wanted to make the point that to understand modern macro and monetary policy, I think it's super relevant to understand how all of these things like central bank independence, the Taylor Rule came about. And to understand this context is, I think, very, very important because, oh, yeah. And the second point I would, I, I just wanted to make is capital theory. Um, Arash is somebody who is absolutely, uh, you know, um, knowledgeable in this field, um, absolutely. Um, but most of the macroeconomists basically start out, you know, with Hicks, and that's basically it, you know. So, um, but there's so much more that. Uh, you know, that can be told here about why we have a certain form of capitalism going on. So this makes it a little bit, maybe a little bit more catchy um, in the education of PhD school students to tell these stories. Um, and and to, to make a long story um, short, to help students and to help economists to find um, alternative set of theoretical assumptions that might be tested and that might contribute to uh, theoretical evolution. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Stefan or Rudi, do you want to answer to this? Well, just briefly because I mean, mm -hmm. I'm neither into money nor into capital, but um, a fascinating way and that probably um, also strengthens Eki's point is the way 
many, many of us have heard of the list and some of us are on that mailing list. Uh, German economist Karl Christian von Weizsäcker, the way he's using inspirations, let's say from Bumbawerk or from, from Fischer or, uh, right? So um, somebody who is very knowledgeable about the history of the field can be extremely innovative, even at old age, um, about very current issues, whether we agree with him or not, but it's certainly a very original take, uh, both when it comes to theory of interest and capital and money, so I think he can be taken, the ones of you who know him, um, as, uh, as really a, an ideal how history of thought, serious study of history of thought, uh, can inform highly innovative research. I don't know, Rudy, if you agree with that, but uh, that is how I would basically fortify and strengthen what Eki said. I agree, and I, I actually want to just repeat what Ara said in the chat. Um, Fari, Emmanuel Fari, uh, rest in peace, um, uh, um, actually did that recently, uh, taking up capital theory, if, if, I, if I remember correctly. But my answer to that is, um, yes, absolutely, just do it. What's preventing you from doing it in some sense, okay? Everyone who, who I mean, there's no one that, that prohibits anyone from going through all the economic texts and 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 find inspiration uh, for today. Um, I'm, I'm I'm certainly not denying that 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 can be a, a source, a strong source of inspiration. Just as as I said, empirical evidence um, or or other you know um, or other things, uh, you know, political urgencies, for example. All these things can be strong motivators, and I'm not denying that anyone. Um, uh, um, uh, sh sh should not do it. Who, who am I to, t to tell anyone, basically, when they get their, their research inspiration from? But that, that uh, so in, th in that sense, I fully agree. And that's basically, Chaif is my, uh, uh, my initial statement, you know, uh, uh, to the extent that, you know, uh, sort of reading old books and, and, and you know, uh, making, that that helps making a contribution to current debates, both on the theory front or on the policy front, um, um, I'm, I'm all for it and who wouldn't be in some sense, right? Um, I, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. What, what, what I'm less, as I said, what, I just can only repeat it, what I'm less interested in is sort of uh, uh, economic history uh, sort of for its own sake, whatever that means. And even that is a, is a, is a, a certain, you know, a certain is obviously a, a justifiable um, um, uh, intellectual exercise, uh, just as you know, being an ancient historian is. Um, it's just of less interest to me as a, as a current economist. That's all. But Rudy, I I agree that people are free to do whatever they want, but of course, preferences are shaped, and people. I mean. I've, I've been to two AEA conferences and I love the AEA ASSA setting. I just don't know if people like top grad, sc grad schools, graduates, if they really know that those old texts exist and that the very roundabout way to get into them is, is worth pursuing, right? So of course they're free to do that, but they don't even know that a, a course, history economic thought exist because they've been educated without one. So shaping their preferences and shaping their alertness that there might be something out there in the old books to, to dig at, I think, is the prerequisite for them to look. The problem is that I would argue, and now we can, that, that sort of, we have an identification problem. The, the, what Immanuel Fari did, or people like Ivan Werning, you know, the great theorists of our time, that's extremely rare, right? So the typical inspiration will come from a very mundane, you know, policy problem, as I said, evaluating the minimum wage in Kentucky. Okay, that's, that's how economists uh, write dissertations. Maybe that's what uh, Professor McCloskey calls, calls the degeneracy of economics. I don't know, but that's the fact on the ground. I mean, that's how, what economic dissertations are written about and what people are frankly, policymakers are interested in. Um, uh, and, um, and I'm not sure that, 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 that those dissertations will be inspired by going back to the, 
uh, will uh, inspire uh, going back to the uh, to the great books. Uh, someone mentioned, I think, in the chat that theory, it's theory that should be more inspired. But uh, newsflash, theory period is in decline in economics. Um, you know, it's it. we will have discussions and we already have them. In fact, um, the way, for example, Raj Shetty, when Raj Shetty took over from Greg Mankiw, the Econ 101, right? He completely revamped that curriculum in a very to, in a in a in a very empiricist kind of way, right? So Harvard uh, educates their undergraduates in the in the first economic course they see, and frankly, an economic course that a lot of Harvard undergraduates see. I believe a third of Harvard undergrads uh, hear that, even if they're not econo majors, in a way that yeah, that follows the Raj Shetty program program, which is an ex highly empiricist program. Okay, and uh, and um, and that's it. So theory is on the decline. I think we will have debates in in at least lower ranked graduate school uh, graduate programs to dispense with a, a second year uh, with, with a, a, an entire year of microeconomic theory. Frankly, these debates will be ongoing, and so uh, and so and by the way, I, and maybe this is a. This is a point of alliance between history of economic thought people and people like macroeconomists like me, who still value a little bit of theory. Um, but this is the fight we are ha we will be having. I mean, the, even demanding you know a, a minimum basic amount of theory uh, will uh, uh, will will be will be um, uh, is on the decline. I'm I'm afraid, quite frankly. So and so the the, the empirical turn in economics is overwhelming, and. Um, yeah, for the, given that, I think the case for economic, for, his, for the history of economic thought is, is even more difficult to make. And of course, there will always be the Faris and the Iran burnings, there will, well, or, or the Karl Christian von Weizsäcker, who will get this inspiration. And we need to find a way to keep that alive, but it's going to be a struggle. But don't you think that, I mean, I, I find it super interesting what you say. Don't you think that, again, thinking of potential complementarities, that if you study, I mean, for example, today's, if I put myself into the shoes of somebody 25 at Harvard or 20 or whatever, right? So, and then he's confronted with that choice which you made, right? So theoretical research or uh, empirical term, wouldn't it be helpful for that person to have heard of the Methodenstreit, to have heard how the historical school ended into nothing to a certain extent, precisely because it exaggerated the empirical turn, I, I think that today's student who is confronted with the debate which you just addressed doesn't even have the categories to um, to understand those tensions, and it would be a I long, yeah. would be a uh, yes. route to teach him where that led in the past, right? I think oh, this. I agree with you. We, they should learn about the methodist right? I'm afraid the powers to be and the the power structure in the profession is um, is uh, is at a phase where I think the the, the Schmollers uh, uh, was it Schmoller yeah uh, that the Schmollers uh, are taking over again. Um, I think that's just a fact, an undeniable fact. And frankly, I'm I'm um, I'm uh, I'm not high enough up the food chain to do anything about it. I think there's so this... I regret it. I think this very nicely leads to a question that Michael Wolgemuth posted in the chat a while ago. Uh, do you want to pause it yourself or should I read it, Michael? Okay, I read it. Um, so Michael asked, uh, you mentioned the beauty of economics. Most students find it rather ugly, dismal, but at least perhaps useful. Where's the beauty, um, the emotional attraction in economics? Uh, how could it be generated? And does the history of economic thought play a role there? Most of Michael's question, it's a wonderful one. I would even say a beautiful yep. one. So, yep. um, so I think to begin with, it's helpful to readdress that old question, which is hardly addressed in any econ textbook today, which is, is economics a science or an art? Now, if we say that there is something like art to it, which would mean that ethics and aesthetics have a place in economics, right? That we are not, we are a science, but as all social sciences, we are somehow a mixture of the two. Then we can start ref reflecting about issues like um, beauty. And beauty, I don't mean in the 
formal sense. I never was bad at math and I didn't find mathematical models ugly. The beauty <clears throat> I find in moments of teaching, whomever I might be teaching and don't have to be my students in Svika, it can be other students. The beauty is whenever you have an audience of students ahead of you who realize how that science helped get poor people out of poverty. And so if you take history of economics and show those super, super diverse characters, which are on that AEA calendar behind me, and if you show that actually most of them, and perhaps on, on an abstract level, all of them had that one goal, and that the field itself, being a science, but also again, being an art, and governance is probably more an art than a science, succeeded in getting so many billions of people out of poverty, that is a moment of beauty. So that's how I would define it. Thank you, Stefan. That was a very beautiful answer to, to this um, tricky question, because I think, um, you know, emotional attraction um, for, for the field of economics um, and, um, and, and the emotional beauty to be able to, to help other people um, you know, get out of poverty, and as you mentioned, is, uh, is, is a very important point. Thanks. Um, Rudi, do you also have an opinion on this? I mean, the sort of Stefan outlined one approach. I think at the end of the day, uh, in my experience, is you got to be motivated yourself as a teacher. You basically have to be brimming for, for fascination mm -hmm. with economics. That's basically half, half if not three quarters of, of what gets you good evaluations, but not just good evaluations, genuine appreciation um, uh, from the students. So you, you just don't, in that sense, you really shouldn't be a dull person in the classroom. Um, I was thinking when, when, when uh, I, I was thinking about another problem that sort of spontaneously occurred to me when, when Stefan, when Stefan uh, talked about the, yeah, mostly, I guess, and probably exclusively white men behind him. Um, I'm worried about, uh, not at Notre Dame, we don't have, we don't have too much of a work at Notre Dame, but I'm worried about, you know, at least at U.S. college campuses um, of a more secular, uh, of a more secular uh, um, direction, I'm worried, frankly, that if you, if you start telling them that, you know, our science is basically completely white men, they're going to go ballistic. I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure that that would all help all that much quite a, Quite, quite, quite frankly, I think uh, it would, it, it might go the opposite way. They might actually find out that it's, you know, it's all those old white men that, you know, instituted capitalism and, uh, and uh, suppressed, uh, uh, you know, people of color. Uh, so I'd be careful with that, by the way, at least in the US context. Which is very is. I'm a cynical, I know, but. <laughs> well, no, I share this apprehension and uh... I think we should be sensitive to those things. Uh, I uh, fully agree. Fortunately, uh, it can be also taught differently. And uh, yeah, but um, again, perhaps it's also a way to understand why, how long women were kept from studying uh, that beautiful field, right? But again, I fully agree that this is not, uh, and it is, it, it is already a problem for political scientists and philosophers uh, teaching. Um, so when I was in Bloomington, that was a, that was a recurrent issue. There's, there's another question from Gerhard Wegner in the chat, and I think it would be interesting to have the perspectives of both of you on it. And it's simply, is there a standard for a good history of economic thought? Gerhard, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> because I think good depends on, as always, on the purpose you're uh, reaching for. I think regarding students, we talked a lot, right? So I think good history of economics would be history of economics, which gets students hooked for economics. So that would be the standard for good with regard to students. Um, and also critical about what they're taught in their theory and methods classes, right? So that would be, that would be the standard. And then when it comes to research, I would say good means inspiring. So if the Stanford series inspires grad students there to think about issues which they haven't thought of because they had never heard of a person and of a branch in the tree which Deidre described, that would be good. So inspiring, illuminating, provocative, 
um, that would be, when it comes to research, the translation of good, which I would give. I'd agree with that, nothing to add. Okay. So, uh, may, may, I, may, I, may I qualify yeah. the question? Um, um, what, what does scientific progress mean in the field of the history of economic thought? That's Is there a standard for this? That's an even tougher one. Um, because, well, we compare apples and bananas, right? So we compare, let's say, if we take Schumpeter or Pribram, or if we take, uh, well, I mean, they were socialized in a very different way. They produced their uh, papers and books for a very different audience. So um, humble and skeptical as I am about progress in economics, uh, in the way I try to do it in a non nihilistic way, I'm probably even more skeptical about progress in history economic thought. I mean, the field exists, the field is a baby of the historical school, right? So it doesn't exist that long. It exists in a systematic way for about, let's say, 150 years now. But then the modes of production and the, at those different dots, I think, constitute a time series which, or a panel, which is so, so heterogeneous about the people who produced, about the, the purposes of what they did, that I don't know, I don't know about progress. And certainly, I think none of the historians here, including the most ambitious ones, would say that they have passed over Schumpeter or passed over, uh, reached over, uh, right? So um, I don't know. Um, that's a very, I think it's a super difficult to answer. Yeah, thanks. Um, Casey Pender is the next one. Hi. Yeah, yeah thanks, guys. This has been uh, super interesting so far. Um, I have a question, sort of maybe more directed to Professor Kolov, but coming off of something uh, Professor Bachman had sort of started off with in his intro. And this is sort of coming from the perspective as a, of a PhD student in a North American university. Um, but I think in like, you know, some of the ways you guys have, have pushed forward the value of uh, history of economic thought is I'm very sympathetic towards, right? Like the sort of ideal case of, you know, going into these old books and grappling with some of these old ideas and then being able to use that to inform, uh, you know, either critique or push forward, uh, you know, current models in economics. Um, but it seems to me in order to do that, you first need to understand the current models. And, you know, that's becoming increasingly difficult to do right, as sort of Rudy mentioned, these models are becoming more and more technical. We only have a very short amount of time in graduate school to learn all these things. And so my worry is sort of twofold. One, you know, you can have, Stefan, what you mentioned earlier is this sort of bad history of thought where you get people critiquing uh, current uh, economic models without really having ever taken the time to understand what's actually going in the models. And I, you know, I, without throwing anyone under the bus or saying that you often see maybe like Austrians critiquing DSGE models likely never having worked with the DSG model or knowing the sort of the guts of the model at all. Um, but then vice versa, if we're to like, unless we're maybe, you know, maybe at Harvard, this isn't a problem where everyone's a genius, but at normal, at, you know, if we're not in the top tier schools, I'm not sure we have the time in the day to both learn, you know, these heterogeneous new Keynesian models, but also scour through Visser in a, you know, in a way that we can actually digest these things and, and internalize these debates. And so, I'd be curious to know, uh, Stefan, with the sort of the increase in the technical requirements of a grad school, how you'd balance the time it would take to sort of take these historical debates seriously. Let me first briefly agree with what Erwin wrote in the chat about, uh, let's say, the case in point being Smithian uh, or Adam Smith's scholarship and how it progressed. So that's an answer to Gerhard's question. Casey, good to see you again. Um, so thank you for the question. Again, it's not an either or. I don't say that you should study history instead of models or instead of empirical methods. Um, and of course, the emphasis remains on theory and empirical methods. I just believe that, uh, and we've had many conversations over beer uh, about that in Prague, so it's not the first one, this case of disclosure here. Um, I I think the curious question is really what type of students do we attract to economics? And at the beginning, as I see it, you have a very diverse crowd in the audience. And the question is who is left after the first year? Uh, and I'm afraid, and again, that 
varies over countries. And of course, a PPE program like the one you studied uh, is different. But I'm afraid that we, that the ones remain who are interested in the technicalities, nothing against that. And I'm afraid of losing those who are perhaps not that good at math and then the models, but could cope with the math and the models, but who actually picked the field because they heard that economics has something to do with inequality, something to do with unemployment and all that. And have also ethical concerns which are on their minds, so they want to improve the world. And I'm afraid of losing those kids, right? So, um, and for that, I would again plea. So my plea is really some small history, some small methodology uh, course. Can be one, can be two, doesn't matter. Not to lose those kids with social questions and with ethical concerns. I don't mind keeping the other ones, but I don't want a monoculture of the other ones who then dominate the um, sophomore and other years, because that would be a heavy loss, right? Okay, then we have uh, Ottmar Issing on the list. Thank you. First, I must apologize because, because I had to leave for some time. So if I repeat something which was said, I apologize. But uh, uh, I was induced to make a comment when it was about beauty. Uh, beauty is an um, emotional category, an, uh, a category of, uh, of uh, preferences, etc. And uh, I was reminded in this moment, there are, there's a beauty contest. Uh, when I was at the ECB and uh, there were new publications, I had no time or, uh, to read or fully understand. I asked an expert of, in my staff. And uh, on such a situation, an expert came, it was a model by Woodford, and uh, he was so fascinated and I said to him, uh, you are fascinated by that. And he said, it's because of the beauty of the model. Uh, so there are different kinds of model. Uh, I would agree with Stefan that uh, most students might have more sympathy for uh, the not mathematical beauty. Uh, but there is also a category uh, uh, for which all the aesthetics of a model uh, represent a kind of beauty. So uh, I was just differentiate the, this remark a bit. Uh, and second, second, uh, I think it's obvious if economists uh, make recommendations uh, for the real economy to improve the situation of people, poor, etc., uh, without knowledge of the political circumstances of history and history of economic thought, they must fail. They must fail. And to what extent this prerequisite, which is indispensable, is lost? Just take the example of the so-called new monetary theory. Um, it means that the government can print money at will, and as soon as this will end in inflation, then the government will ri raise taxes and collect the money which creates inflation. Against the background of any historical experience, this is, this is nonsense or such a naivety of the political process uh, that uh, I think it should be totally ignored. Anybody would, uh, who would make such a proposal for politics in reality uh, should be la laughed at. Uh, and uh, I think it was Larry Summers who said this uh, would do economics or whatsoever. Uh, but uh, this knowledge is, is lost. And so those proposals come on in a, on a high, high level and it has, it has a substantial influence uh, on political thinking in the Democratic Party, for example, in the US. And my final point is the following. We can observe that uh, after after three decades now of very low inflation. Uh, there is spreading the notion that inflation is something of the past. Uh, something of the past. And I think uh, history and history of economic thought tells us, be at least cautious. Uh, things are changing. 
uh, and the idea that uh, as um, uh, Bob Schiller has uh, no it was no no sorry it was uh, this time is different it was by by oh my god the two others uh, can can rock off this time is different and he this is the core of the, uh, the, the problem because the notion before the um, last financial crash uh, was that we live in a different time. This time is different. And they have shown that uh, over a period of 800, year, eight, 800 years with more than 60 countries, whenever there was a uh, high indebted uh, situation of economy of the public and private sector, uh, Coll uh, um, financial collapse followed. Uh, so um, today you can observe in many technical papers, um, they rely on the notion that this time is different. Um, hedging is so perfect, etc. Uh, so I think uh, seeing a new approach in the context of uh, the past, I think helps uh, to be I, I'm not against writing uh, in, intellectually high uh, motivating, motivating papers, uh, but they should not claim that there is this is something which should be tested in reality or could be tested. I think this uh, the, the warning for me, history of economic thought and uh, knowledge of history implies uh, above all a warning against uh, modes, fashions uh, in uh, economics. I, I should stop here. Thank you. Uh, if I can chime in quickly. Yeah. Uh, because the, the, the historian of, econo the, the, the theoretician of economic thought uh, makes me uh, correct uh, Professor Issing a little bit. I think he meant the modern mon monetary theory, the MMT. Um, yeah. New monetary economics is actually something different. That's a, no, a, very, different mean... research, a very different research program, uh, which is uh, centered around a search theory, um, and uh, which is very different from modern monetary economics. Absolutely. So, sorry, sorry. Yeah. It was we, we, we will have to be, we ha have to be precise. Yeah. OK. You I wanted to say, the other thing I wanted to say is, um, and I think economic, economic historians and historians of economic thought need to think a little bit about maybe the marketing here, because the way uh, Professor Issing now justified looking into history is largely um, uh, saying uh, we need to have a sense of economic history, not necessarily of, econo of the history of economic thought, right? And that I think um, um, sort of mainstream economists, especially after the, the financial crisis would be much more sympathetic Right. I think economic history has has had a genuine re revival uh, in the field um, because it also because it sort of uh, drew in young uh, uh, young people uh, with modern techniques. As I said, uh, Moritz Schullerich in Germany is is one of them. Christoph Trebesch is another one. Those two are publishing at the highest levels. They are, uh, you know, recognized in the international research community. So that 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 economic history, especially economic macro history, um, is an is an important dimension that we should probably teach more in economic curricula. I think that that by now is complete consensus. Uh, I guess we could do more. So this needs to be implemented. But at least the idea there's a big consensus there. And maybe, by the way, strategically and marketing wise, there's something to be learned also for economic, historians of economic thought. Be learned, those, you guys could learn something from the economic historians, because as I said, they actually had a successful renaissance, I would claim. Um, and so, but on the other hand, if, if it can't be the, the claim for the existence of the history of economic thought cannot just be the things that Professor Ising just mentioned, namely that we should be aware of, you know, his historical episodes where certain fashionable things went horribly wrong, because that already is taken care of by the economic historians themselves, and they have a place already. So the history of economic thought has to deliver something else, I would say, and what that something else is, 
you know, that's for you to think about, I guess. I, I apologize. It's, of course, modern MMT, uh, yeah. uh, very clear. Uh, let, me, let me try to uh, make two brief suggestions uh, as to what historians of economics could contribute. So I fully agree with Ottmar Rising about the, that we lost the political in political economy. And so coming back to the branches of Diedrich and Klosky, I think that twist from political economy to economics is one of those uh, which personally, given my research interests, which are somewhere between history of economic and history of political thought, uh, <clears throat> is the most curious branch. So what got lost there and to what extent can we reclaim that by the, by the way uh, political economy is practiced by today's economists? So is that really the comeback of the political or do we need um, to take it even more seriously? And so for that, uh, I'm specifically happy that the Center at Duke is not called Center for the History of Economics, but the Center for the History of Political Economy, because I think that name um, actually admonishes and warns us uh, that we should always see the economic uh, in the context of the political and in the other orders. And the second thing about what economics can contribute to such discussions about um, the history of economics, uh, uh, this time it's all different. Um, I think and again, I have to say something good about the historical school being the editor of Schmollers Jahrbuch. And the historical school actually was having a very, I think, interesting debate within itself as to the topicality of theories. So when do we have a theory which is, in, which is important, which for that time and space in that institutional and cultural context helps and when not? Whereas in today's economics, we believe that the theory is either right or wrong, either logically consistent or not, which is certainly true, but that is not enough, right? So we have to say within the logically consistent theories, which are the ones which help in that specific point of time with that specific crisis, which we are fighting. And I think history of economics precisely by showing why we forget theories which are not topical, but then those theories come back, just like broadly speaking Keynesianism after the financial crisis, well, in a stable world, we don't need it. In a less stable world, we do. So forgetting can be uh, an omission, right? So I think in that regard, um, studying history of economics makes you aware that a forgotten theory is not a bad theory and can be extremely helpful if the, mom if the constellation of time and space reappears, again, the context. Well, I, I disagree with you slightly. I mean, that that is a bit, now you are committing the, the mistake that you said you don't want to commit, namely, I think you are selling, um, in this particular case, perhaps macroeconomists, modern macroeconomists, a little bit you're short, for, quite frankly. I mean, we are very aware of the scope conditions, right? And I mean, I'm sure the audience here knows that little beautiful book by Danny Rodrick, Economics Rules, which is about all, it's, it's all about that. It's all about scope conditions. Um, and, and, and I mean, good economists know the scope conditions of their models. And they, they, they are very aware that a, a good model is not, you know, a, a true theory or something that's sort of, you know, always true and always applicable. Good, I think good economists, even modern economists know that. They're always bad economists, by the way, and uh, bad economists are precisely who are not aware of the scope conditions. And, and, and that's precisely the reason why we, I, 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 I don't know why you can claim that Keynesianism has come back. I mean, we've always ta taught, at least in under, our undergraduate classes, I've never stopped ke uh, teaching Keynesian economics. And I've never, and I also have taught, uh, uh, you know, classical business or neoclassical business cycle models, precisely because I want undergrads to understand that there is no such thing as one model of the business cycle. But it's, you know, there are multiple models of the business cycle that help us understand various aspects of the business cycle. I, I, and I, 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 would, I would be shocked if I'm the only one who teaches macroeconomics like that. We have always taught multiple models for one and the same phenomenon. Um, uh, and that, I, I don't think we ever, we ever abandoned that. So I don't, I, now you thought as, you sold us a little short, uh, Stefan, I think. Perhaps it depends on one's teachers. And, uh, okay, right. but I would be shocked if I'm unique. Uh, yeah. I'm using standard textbooks. So. Okay, so we've been discussing for two hours, and I think it's about time to come to an end uh, before we all get too exhausted. Um, I'm sorry to all whose comments in the chat and, and other comments um, we can't uh, um, discuss anymore. So, just as a 
as two brief closing statements from both of you, I'd like to just know very briefly if you can give one seminar on a specific topic in the history of economic thought, just one seminar, what would you choose as a topic? Rudi, if you want to start. That's extremely difficult because I'm, I'm really a lay person as far as the, <laughs> so I, I, would, I would feel overwhelmed, uh, uh, quite frankly. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say sort of the, 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 the rise of RBC theory, basically. And the, okay. that, I think this is an important, uh, sort of an important uh, breaking point um, um, and a bit underappreciated. I, I really do believe, actually, that RBC theory is, is, is unjustly bashed uh, these days. Mm. Um, uh, um, again, if you, of course, if you are, if you are an ideolo ideologue, like uh, I guess it's fair to say Ed Prescott is, um, then, you know, then uh, uh, th that is a problem. But uh, uh, it, it, it really opened up horizons, thought horizons, to me at least, uh, that that were un unknown to me, so I, I, I'd rather so I'd think harder about that that kind of episode. Um, mm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, and Stefan. Oh, it doesn't come as a surprise, but I would like to motivate it very briefly. Um, what I would teach, and not just now to piss Rudy off or something like that. That's not <laughs> that's not what I was doing in the two hours, and I won't do it now again. But what I will teach, and I've taught that that, or I've given that lecture at various places also in the US is really that contested and that's how I met Rudy for the first time in FAZ in 2009. I really teach with a passion a public lecture about order liberalism and I'll tell you why. Mm. Uh, I teach it because we live, and that was different in 2009, right? So back then indeed you had a point that, uh, well, what had those old guys to tell us? But the world in, in those 12 years, ever since the youngest Methodenstreit kicked off by your intervention, has become so fragile that regrettably, uh, the world has become much more comparable to the world of the 30s and 40s. And that's why I believe that economics of the type of order liberalism, I mean, it doesn't have to be about the order, liberal, order liberals, but I think their legacy, they're conceptualizing the economy as a suborder within society and their impetus to stabilize the whole, which in a certain abstract way is also not that different from Keynes's, um, is something which has regained its topicality, and I would say, unfortunately so. Not only in the US, but certainly also in Europe. So that would be, and that has been over the past years, a lecture which I've given in different varieties. And again, in 2009, I was a grad student in my first, second year, the stuff was dead. Eki, I don't know if he's still here. Eki and I were the two guys who were doing stuff like that. Uh, meaning history of order liberalism. Unfortunately, there is now a huge literature on that. And I say unfortunately because the times have changed so that this research program has gained its topicality. I love that as a scholar, but I hate that as a citizen. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thanks, Rudi. Thanks, Stefan, for this very lively discussion, for this very broad and both broad and deep discussion. It was very interesting and thanks to all participants um, for comments. Uh, if we have a bit more time, it's really worth to uh, read into the parallel discussion in the chat, which is also quite in interesting. Uh, so thank you all and I hope to see you soon at another news event and have a nice evening. Goodbye.